Are you in Acts chapter 1? Yes. If you haven't found it by now, there's no hope for you. <laughs> Just kidding, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Acts chapter 1, let's pick it up where we left off last time. We were talking about being assembled together in verse number 4. It says, and they being assembled together with them, commanded them, uh, and, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou again, wilt thou at this time again restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, he went up. Uh, behold, while, and while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up. There it is. I knew something was wrong. Behold, two men stood by him in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Father, we love you this afternoon, and we thank you for a great day in church today. We thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the way you provide for us. We ask you, Father, to keep your hand on us. Father, we believe it is, and we desire your hand on us more than anything in the world. Lord, I, I need you. God, I look around, and I, I see people that have needs. I see people that are struggling. I see people that are trying. I see people with grief and with loss, with struggles, with issues. Uh, Lord, people that are, are, are struggling against sin, they're struggling against the world, the flesh, the devil, uh, all kind of stuff, Lord. And we, we're just a needy people. And we're here, Father, because cause we need you and you got what we need. And God, we're here also because we love you, because of what you've already done for us. If you never do another thing for us, we are just eternally in your debt. And so we thank you for being so good, and we pray now... To this, this morning, God, that you just, this afternoon, that you just put your hand on us again, open up this Bible to us, convict our hearts, give us what we need, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Don't forget what I said to you last time, they being assembled together, and being assembled together with them, when Jesus Christ showed back up to them, he assembled with them. And man, I am telling you, that's what it's all about. Uh, a building is sticks and bricks. Hello? <laughs> Buildings can have good memories and bad memories. I, I don't, don't hold me to this, what I'm going to say. Let me just give you my thoughts and opinion on something that I can't necessarily prove. I got some reasons to say it and some things that I could show you that may back up what I'm saying, but I wouldn't argue with anybody about it. Uh, buildings, I think, I think buildings and things can have a spirit to them, even if they're dead. The Bible talks about idols having a bad spirit in them that's, that's, that's possessing that idol to get the worship that the people are given when they bow down to the aid to worship, quote-unquote, yeah. right? So buildings can probably even have a spirit about them. Some of that's in people's dramatic mindset, right? You know, it's haunted, ooh, you know, and it's not. But there may be some validity to some of it. Mm-hmm. What I'm trying to tell you is that what we need is the presence of the Lord. Amen. What that new building is all about, what this building's been all about from day one, it's the presence of God. Amen. I don't allow on this, in this property or on this building, I don't allow any secular music. I don't like it. If it happens, I stop it. Because I don't like it. I want, I want the music played in this place to be played to the glory and honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want everything about this place to be the Lord, the book, the Lord, the book, the Lord, the book, and the brethren. <laughs> but did you notice the emphasis? The Lord, the book, the Lord, the book, the Lord, the book, and the brethren. <laughs> right? Um, when we assemble together, the point of that thing is for Jesus to step into the middle. And he wants you assembled. I want you to understand that. The Lord wants you to come and be here in person as much as you can. Listen, I understand that people have to work. I understand the day and age that you live in that a lot of times uh, custody issues and all kinds of things like that, you have to miss here and there. Things happen. I'm not trying to, to beat you up about that. What I'm trying to tell you is stick to whatever you are convinced God wants you to do. 
So if you come Sunday morning only, keep coming Sunday morning only. As you grow, if you want to come back and join us, we have two more services. You're welcome to come. But whatever you're doing, don't back off on what you're doing. Don't go from being Sunday morning to every other Sunday to once a month. Don't give me this we can watch online stuff. Listen, if you're healthy enough and capable enough to go walk around the store and go look at dresses, ladies, if you're healthy enough and capable enough to go pick out groceries and put them in the cart and come home, you can come sit on a pew. Don't give me this COVID stuff. Don't give me that stuff. I'm not buying it. You go to the grocery store, you don't know what slimy kid was drooling all over that cart before you got it. <laughs> Snot going everywhere. Come on, don't give me this stuff. You don't know what last person touched that cart, went to the bathroom and didn't wash their hands. I'm not trying to be mean or nasty or crude. I'm getting a little crude, I know, but you don't just think about it for a second. You can still go grab that cart and go for the groceries. You don't know who was picking their nose before they grabbed that cart. I'm making a point, and you won't forget my point now, will you? You won't touch a grocery cart again the same way either. <laughs> but that's the truth of it. But then it's like, oh, I don't want to go sit in that crowded building because everybody's sick, but you'll go to the sport game and shoulder to shoulder with everybody and not worry about it. And that's the devil. You can't get from watching on the Internet what you get from assembling together. You can't do it. To this day, to this day, the number one best sales tactic is face-to-face, person-to-person. To this day, people still buy from people they like. Period. Your doctor might be a lousy doctor, but if you like them, you're swearing up and down how great they are. No matter what the reviews online say. You understand that? What I'm trying to say is you can't beat face-to-face. That's why he said, go ye into all the world. That's why the best witness is not us Facebook marketing the area. The best witness is not us postcard mailing the area. The best witness is not us putting up billboard signs all around the area. We've done it. We've spent thousands of dollars running billboard signs throughout the metro Detroit area. I think they told us uh, the estimated traffic was 250,000 cars a day with the five different billboards we ran around the area with invite to the church and the address of the church and scripture signs up and all the rest of that. Guess how many visitors we had from two different months. We did it for five weeks, two different campaigns, five week long campaigns, five different billboard signs around Michigan, scheming and planning and trying to do this stuff. You know, the axe head without the, the, without the maker swinging the axe, trying to get all this stuff done in the power of my will and my desire to reach people and starting a Bible institute and starting a reformers thing for drug and alcohol addicts and all the other things we tried to do to grow the church. Guess how many visitors we had come from billboard signs? We spent, we spent, I think, like two grand or something like that where they paid, uh, or 500, do you even remember, Rob, 500 or a grand or two grand? I don't know what the total was. We did multiple Facebook campaigns where they only bill us when somebody clicks on our thing and it uses up and it was a few cents a click. Hundreds of dollars, right? I don't, I don't remember exactly. It was a lot. A lot of clicks for the money we put out there. We got one visitor from all of that one time and they got mad and left and never came back. Do you know what's filled up this building and filled up that parking lot and seen souls saved and filled up the baptismal pools? God's plan, not technology. I'm not against posting the messages online. We do, and I know the Lord's used them. I'm not against live stream. I'm thankful for it for the people that literally can't be here and want to stay caught up, and I think it's good for them. But I'm telling you folks, you don't beat assembling together. Your kids aren't going to be able to play on the playground and make memories. They aren't going to be able to be in the nurseries. And I, can you imagine, Could you ever imagine that we'd have a nursery playground? Do you ever imagine that? You know how that happened? Not from people watching online. From God's people assembling together. Can you imagine we're doubling the size of our nurseries? That's from people showing up. You say all the stuff you want, but you can't band your finances together and support missionaries like we can all do together. And you can't find or vet the missionaries like we can and will as a group. God set this thing up and right from the beginning in the book of Acts after he died, was buried and rose again. He showed up in their presence and he said, wait for the promise of the Father which ye have heard of me. Go back to John chapter 14. Look at what promise that is. John chapter number 14.
John 14, 16. He said, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another, see it? With a capital C. That he may abide with you till you backslide. That he may abide with you till you lose it. That he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit, capital S, of what? Truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy truth. is truth. Huh. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This thing is so intricately woven, you can't separate God from his book, and you can't separate the Spirit from the Savior, you can't separate the Son from the Father, they're one. That's why we're not overemphasizing the Bible by preaching the way we do about the Bible. I'm not overemphasizing the Bible by telling you, get in your Bible, believe your Bible, memorize your Bible, read your Bible, listen to your Bible preached, respond to the Bible when the Bible convicts you, build it all and base it all off the Bible. I'm not out of bounds. You study the Bible and you can't separate them from each other. It's not possible. He said, I'm going to give you the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. They can't get it. I'm telling you, they're so crazy. they just so crazy. When you throw away the truth of the Word of God, they're so crazy, they start saying, well, follow the science. And then they say science that isn't science is science, even though it's unscientific and proven to not be science. You know what it is? When you reject God and when you reject the Bible, God rejects your mind. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. When you play with the Bible and mess around with the Bible and reject the Bible, God will mess with your head. And you're watching it happen all the way around this country. I know, I literally know personally professionals in the field of psychology and professionals in the field of psychology are saying the mental health crisis in this country is escalating exponentially. That is directly connected to a lack of comfort. That is directly connected to a lack of truth. That is directly connected to people not following Jesus Christ, not being in the Bible, not listening to the Spirit of God, throwing it all away, not receiving the truth, but receiving sin at an exponential rate, diving into sin head first, like diving into a septic tank and thinking they're enjoying it because pigs like slop. It's a rejection of the truth. But man, if you got the Lord, you know what you got? You got comfort. It says, because it hath not seen him, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in you, with you, with you, he dwelleth with you, them, and shall be. See the future tense? So at the time of Jesus Christ's ministry, they didn't have what we have with the sealing of the Spirit of God. He was with them. He said, it shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. I will come to you. He's saying, I'm going, and I'm going to send the comforter, and when I send the comforter, I'm coming. You know what you got if you got the Spirit of God? That's the Spirit of Christ. You know what that is? That's Jesus Christ in you. I just said you can't separate them. You can't figure this stuff out. How can you figure this out? How can you understand? You can grab a hold of God. You just got to believe what the book says and go, okay, so that's what it is. That means the Spirit of Christ is in me. That's Jesus in me, and he's come back to me, but he's in the form of the Spirit of God. I mean, that's just what it is. You, let's not make rocket science out of it. It just tells you what it is. What a blessing it is. I, I'm thankful I got the Spirit of God. I, I love the Spirit of God. He's never led me astray. He always keeps me safe. He always comforts me. He always lets me know when I'm messing up, every time. The only problem with it is he won't leave me alone when I want to just enjoy sin. He makes me miserable when I don't listen to him. And he's always right and I'm always wrong, and none of us really like that too much. But you know him for I will not leave you comfortless. Verse 18, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me. Because I live, ye shall live also. Back to Acts chapter 1. So Jesus showed up, and what you got to realize is, is this in verse number 5. He said, for John truly baptized with water. John the Baptist, right? You know what some guys teach? So I, I heard this, I've heard this teach, and this, this is, I've heard this taught, excuse me, and this is taught by people that are taking themselves very seriously when they say it. <laughs> John the Baptist was the founder of the first Baptist church. 
the Baptist church is the right church because we go all the way back to John the Baptist who is the forerunner of Christ and the first Baptist church was with John the Baptist. And they're dead serious. I doubt anybody's intellect that teaches something so ludicrous. When you look at that thing, a testament's not a force till the death of the testator. How could you have a New Testament Baptist church before Jesus Christ even died? That's silliness. That, that's, that's hysterically funny. He says this about John the Baptist. John truly baptized with water, right? But ye shall be baptized, shall be, future tense, baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So he's saying, John baptized with water, and soon you're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. He's making a difference. Follow me. There's a difference between water baptism and being baptized with the Holy Ghost. You see the difference right there. There's a separation between the two. Notice this also, ye shall be. So you're telling me that at this point in the book of Acts, the disciples still don't have the Spirit of God the way you and I do. You follow me on that? I'm going to show you as we go through the book of Acts that the Spirit of the Lord was showing up for some of these folks after they had already confessed Christ and they were getting the Spirit after the fact. Let me ask you a question. When did you get the Spirit of God? The second you got saved, right? You remember the introduction to this thing. I told you the book of Acts is a transitional book. It's a history book. There was a process going on in the book of Acts where the Lord was moving them from the Old Testament system, from the preaching that Jesus gave, over into the New Testament church. Right? So when you go to the book of Acts to build your doctrine for the church, you're on treacherous ground. You've got to understand that. It's all those transition books and transition periods. Very simple. Matthew, Acts, and Hebrews. That's where they all break their necks. So if you understand rightly dividing the word of truth and leave the Bible alone the way it's written, study it in context, then it will make perfect sense to you. So the Lord showed up to his disciples here, and when he appears to them, they're assembled together, and he tells them, soon the Holy Ghost is going to come, and baptize you in the Holy Ghost. You got baptized in the Holy Ghost, you personally, your doctrine in the church age, you got baptized in the Holy Ghost the day you got saved. There was no water there. It was by grace through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. Here's the problem. When people read the Bible, they see a word. And what your mind will do, this is very important to understand and don't ever forget this, it'll help you in every arena of your life. What your mind will do when you hear a word is it will jump to the conclusions that your mind associates that word with. Did you follow me on that? So your mind will associate naturally with a word, and that's the conclusion you'll read into what's said, and you'll say, no, I heard him say that. That's what he said, and that's not what he said at all. Baptism is one of those words. You hear the word baptism, you immediately think water, and your mind goes right to water. But listen... When you run the references throughout the Bible on the word baptism, it's not always talking about water. There's a baptism of fire. Do you know what that is? Well, I'll show you as we go through Acts. Some think that's when the Holy Spirit came with cloven tongues like as a fire, which we'll look at soon. That's not what that is. It didn't say cloven tongues of fire. It said cloven tongues like as of fire. It wasn't fire. It was like as of fire. Baptism of fire is hell. I had somebody call me one time and said, oh, man, you know, I know you're really going through it, and I'm praying for you, man. It's just the baptism of fire. The Lord's putting you through the baptism of fire to make you a better man. And I was like, thank you. I appreciate it. And I let it go. I didn't say nothing. But I was like, no, thank God. I'm not going through hell. I'm never going to go through hell. The Lord's not putting me in hell. I don't believe in purgatory. The baptism of fire is hell. Jesus Christ took care of that for me. Thank God for that. So your mind will associate the two. Sometimes in the Bible, baptism refers to water. It's being fully immersed. It's not sprinkling. It's none of it. It's baptized. It's fully immersed into it. The baptism of fire is fully immersed into a burning devil's hell. Baptism of the Holy Ghost is being fully immersed into the Holy Ghost of God, and you got that when you got saved. 
And he said, that's a baptism you're going to get. Verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou again, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So I mentioned this to you before, and I'll say it again. The disciples were looking for a prophecy conference. You ever notice how obsessed people are with prophecy? Oh, man, what's going on in Israel and Hezbollah and, you know, Lebanon and blah, 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 and Iraq. And they're all obsessed with that stuff. Do you know nine times out of ten you're wasting your time on it? The disciples are just like you. Ain't that a blessing? I told my wife that the other day. I was laughing at myself. I forget even what the context was, but I said, yeah, I ain't no better than the disciples. Actually, I'll, I will tell you what it was. I just remembered what it was. I was thinking if I remember, I'm probably not going to tell them, but I do remember and I can tell you. I said, I'm so exhausted lately, I laid down to pray and fell asleep. <laughs> I woke up and asked God to forgive me and got praying again and fell asleep again. <laughs> she, she looked at me and I was like, I ain't no better than the disciples, you know. Like, <laughs> and you're not. You're not. Thank God for that, right? <laughs> Look, he's telling them in verse number six, um, will thou again restore the kingdom of Israel? What did they want? They wanted to hear all the cool, deep stuff about the Bible. They wanted to know all this crazy stuff. You know what the Lord was interested in? Verse, uh, verse 7. He said unto them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. How do you like that? You know what they're worried about? They're worried about the kingdom. You know what the Lord's worried about? Souls. Go back with me, if you would, to Psalm 131, please. Psalm 131. I want you to see verse number one. Psalm 131, one. Lord, my heart is not haughty, can you say that? Can you say that? Honestly before the Lord. That's a great, that's a great thing to stop and ponder. Nor mine eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters. I don't work at them. Or in things too high for me. You know, there's some stuff, folks, that's just too high for us. Now listen, I ain't no great Bible scholar. And that's not an excuse not to know my Bible. I want to know my Bible. Back to Acts chapter 1, please. I want to know my Bible. I want to have no excuses at all. I want to be, I want to be proficient in the Word of God. As proficient as God can make a man or God can make me to be. Okay? I don't fancy myself to be a Bible scholar. But I purposefully, I purposefully avoid trying to get caught up in all this date and the rapture stuff. You know what you need to do? You need to listen to a message. It's on Sermon Audio by Rick Sowell. Is it, did you listen to it? Somebody else recommended it, heard it recently. By the Field, is it something like that? Who was it that was telling me about it? I listened to it recently. Um, somebody else mentioned it to me. I said, I just listened to it. Rick Sowell. Pastor Rick Sowell, who's the pastor at Hope Baptist when we were there. And I think it's something like by the field. And what he did in that message is he said, I remember growing up in church my whole life, something to the effect of, you can listen to it to, to get it exact. It's a great message. And he said, they were telling me the Lord was going to come back in this date. And this date came and this day went. And then they were telling us the Lord was going to come back in this day. And I believed it and I was sure of it. And that date came and that date went. And they were telling saying, don't do this. And what he was telling them is he was saying, by the field. The Lord might be coming back. So what should I do? Go buy some property. Build a house. Invest in the future. Because what if the Lord doesn't come back? And you wasted your whole life being super spiritual. And now before you know it, you look in the mirror and you got gray hair and wrinkles and grandkids and you got no retirement. And you say, well, I thought the Lord was coming back. You know what we just did, folks? You know what I just got the keys for? Uh, uh, not even, uh, what was it? Yeah, an hour ago, a little over an hour ago. I just got the keys because we bought a field. The Lord might come back tonight. 
I think it'd be great if the Lord blows the trumpet tonight at about 10, 1030 and snatches me out of that auditorium over there. I'm 100% sure he's not going to say, Mike, why did you do that? I'm going to be like, Lord, we didn't even make the first payment yet. You got us out. <laughs> <laughs> you know why? I want him to catch me in the middle, in the middle of investing my life into something worth investing into. You know, God's put it in his own power. This is what I believe about it. You can take it or you can leave it. And I look, I know I got a lot of stuff. I got a lot of things I ain't even telling you that, that, uh, that may or may not be. Do you know it's entirely possible from much better Bible-believing Bible students, I would call them scholars, they would never call themselves that, but I think they're the real type of Bible scholar. Very, very solid stuff on a possibility that God gives us a tiny little warning before the rapture that we could see some things happen that would be clear. That's entirely possible. I haven't wasted your time running the references or showing you that stuff. You know why? Because in your human nature, what you'll do is, okay, well, I'll get right at the last second. When I see that happen, I'll go get gospel tracts, and you're going to let 10, 15, 20 souls you could have led to Christ go to hell and just go let, or let somebody else reach them. Because your human nature, you'll put it off. It's entirely possible you could get a warning. It's also entirely possible that, man, that clock doesn't even spin around one more minute, and bam, we're out of here. Some of you were sugar crashing. That was premeditated. <laughs> I mean, literally half of the crowd just jumped. <laughs> but that's how quick the rapture could hit. I'm serious. I'm dead serious. It could be like right now, boom, there we are, splitting the sky and getting out of here. I can't be sure either way. So I want to live like he's coming right now to get me, and I want to plan like I'm going to die an old man still trying to preach and minister to people. Yes, sir. The Lord's not so interested in filling you in on the prophecy conference. Look what he told them. Look at verse 8. He said, the father's put that stuff in his own power. So I figure there's no sense in me messing with it. But in verse number 8, he said, but ye shall receive power. Sound good? After what? After the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You know what he did for you folks? The second you got saved? Gave you the Holy Ghost. You know what the lie is? The lie is you got to wait till you know more Bible to lead people to Christ. Oh, that's a lie. You know what justice told me? Do you, I, I'm sorry to embarrass you, brother. You don't seem too embarrassed. We're good, right? Okay. I would never share anything too private, but this is, I think this is good. He said, I was there at my little brother's baptism, and I was thinking, why is he getting so serious about God and I'm not, or something to that effect, right? Yes. Yeah, praise the Lord, man. That's worth clapping about. What is Tatum doing? Oh, he can't quote you all the verses of the Bible. He can't. He's, got, he's always got a list of questions of all the verses in the whole Bible after every service for me. Amen. <laughs> I love it too, man. But he can't quote you the whole Bible. You know what he was doing? He was just trying to follow God. And he is trying. Yeah. Pastor, pray for me. I'm going away for football camp. I'm not going to be able to make it to church. And I really, I'm, I'm going to catch up when I get back and listen to them all online. But pray for me while I'm gone because when I'm not there. But I will bring my Bible and I'm reading my Bible while I'm away. You pray for me, preacher. I want to stand strong. Uh, 15, is he 15, 16, 15 years old? Yeah, that, what that, you know what that is? That's what the Holy Spirit can do with somebody. Don't give me all these excuses. I don't know all the verses. You got a power if you got the Holy Spirit of God and you're just trying to obey him through your stuttering, stammering ways. You got the power of God on you to be a witness. He said, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and shall, ye shall be witnesses unto me. Now watch the progression, both in Jerusalem. It doesn't say in Jerusalem and then in. It said both in. Keep witnessing in Jerusalem. And in Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So as a church, we take care of the home front first. Because we can't do anything for the future, or for the uttermost parts, if we're not taking care of the home front. That's why when my preacher said, I told Brother Sal, I said, we got to get a building first. He said, a church can be a church without a building, but they can't be a church without a pastor. You're their first missionary. See, the problem with the, with, with, 
The problem with a lot of young guys is they don't listen to the old men. They think, they don't stop and think. They don't look at what God did with them and, and, and the church that he started in a living room of what God did and say, well, he might know something. They're so super spiritual and self-righteous and so fired up, full, full of zeal and no brains, they can't slow down and say, well, maybe he's right. Maybe he knows something I don't know. What's he up in his 60s now? Brother Peacock up in his, his almost 70, 69, almost 70 years old. Just maybe he, maybe he's learned a little bit of something I don't know. Just, I'm just saying, it's possible. As, no matter how spiritual I am and how much I fast and pray and seek God and, you know, God told me, you know, like, just maybe they know something and learn something I haven't learned yet. And so I said, okay. But I can't talk about that stuff. He said, if you don't teach him, who's going to? God was so merciful to me. He put me in a position where I didn't have to. There were some people that just said, hey, if you're going full time, we're going with you. How much do you need for us to support you? And stepped up. There might be a reason God's blessed this church like he has. You know what we got to do? We got to build home front. But when we become so introverted into ourselves and worried about ourselves that we forget about Judea, that's what I like about going downtown, and I know we haven't been as much lately, and I'm not going to be able to for another month or so, but I'm getting back on that wagon. You know why? I feel like that's our Judea or Samaria. Yeah, that's like a mission field when we go down there and minister to them folks living on the street and them transvestite hookers coming up there and all the rest of that mess down there and feed them and, and give them some clothes. And, and I, feel like, I feel like we ought to be doing that. We're taking care of the poor. I feel like we ought to be that. That ought to be who we are as a church. Not so high and mighty that we can't go down and minister to people that are down on their luck and down and out. So it's their own fault. You know, maybe it is. Maybe it is. And you know what? Your sin is your own fault too. Aren't you glad God didn't act like that with you? Aren't you glad he loved you when you didn't care? You squandered everything he did for you? So let's just go do something for him and let God pay us back because he will. He knows how. And if he doesn't, he doesn't. <laughs> let's just do what we're supposed to do. And under the uttermost part of the earth, I like supporting missions. Amen. I want to get to a point where we, I would like, I would like to see it before I die. I'd like to see, this is crazy. You ready? I'd like to see us put a million dollars into missions a year and take care of what God's given us. You say, that's crazy. I know. I just got a big God. I'd rather die praying and shooting for the stars and trying to do everything I can for the Lord if I'm doing it the right way in the right spirit without a haughty look and a haughty heart. But just trying to see what God can do with us through his spirit and blessing the gospel. I'd rather go out trying and fail. Fail trying. Sure. Than to try nothing and hit my goal. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't fail. You didn't do anything. <laughs> so big deal you didn't fail. So what? Yeah. You're a stinking big old zero with the ring rubbed out, chicken. Fear of failure is a scary thing. Yeah. You make a big to-do about this building, you know. Yeah, well, there's a fear of failure there. It's one thing to buy a building. It's another thing for God to fill it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So fear of failure will paralyze you. Well, if God put his Holy Spirit in us and gave us marching orders, and that's what God's worried about, that's what we ought to do. Yeah. And I'm telling you, God's worried about them. God cares about them. Verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, <laughs> two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which was taken from you into heaven shall go in like manner as ye, uh, shall come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Man, they saw something amazing. The Lord gets caught up and they're like, Can you blame him? Ain't it great when God does something awesome? I mean, when the Lord just really shows up, don't you just want to stand there and gawk at it? <laughs> I mean, a good church service. I mean, we got to pray for some. We got we to all be praying together for some good church services. I mean, we've had some good ones. But I mean, I want some good ones. You know what I mean? I want them so good that like the Lord's here and none of us really want to go. You know what I'm saying? But you know what you can't do? You can't stay in church 24-7. Angels showed up and said, hey, fellas, what are you staring at? How good God's been to me. I can't believe I had got this experience. You know what he's saying? 
yeah, that's great, and we're glad that you did. But now you guys got to go. You got a job to do. You know what's exciting to me about the, what's happening right now? I mean, I was so excited last night. I laid down. I was like, oh, no, Lord, I got to preach in the morning, please. And it's going to be a late night tomorrow. I really, please. And, and he was good to me. He gave me almost eight hours. Huh? It's a huge blessing. But I was so excited about it. You see, my, my youngest was in a baby seat, a car top, a, 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 a car top carrier. <laughs> yeah, that's what we like to do, put her up there. <laughs> she was in a, a car seat <laughs> sitting here on this, on these floors. It was just plywood. There's no carpet down. All these pews were downstairs because we were redoing this thing. And we had three more little stair steps running around trying to corral a two-year-old or yeah, a little over two-year-old and a four-year-old and a six-year-old. My poor wife just exhausted, you know, juggling four kids while we're here till midnight painting. And, you know, it really supercharged our church. You know, what's great is they don't really have memories of that. Anna might have a few memories of it. The other ones are too young. You know what's super cool? We get that opportunity. You know, when you get the chance to stand and stare at it, go ahead and, go ahead and enjoy the moment. Drink it in. But the Lord doesn't want them to stay there. The angels are saying, why are you standing there staring? Watch this in verse 12, and, and we'll stop here for today. Then return they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. So they returned back where they were told, and we'll see it next time. What they did is they got in prayer, and they got in fellowship, and they sang, and they praised, and they were just one step at a time doing what they were supposed to do. And God begins working miracles for them because they were one step at a time doing what they were told to do the way they were told to do it. You know what that is? That's the faith life. All this goofy talk nowadays about, you know, faith, faith, faith life, the faith. You know, let me just make that real for you. Like real, like rubber meets the road, practical daily life. You know what the faith life is? It's the power of God by His Holy Spirit that causes you to know what God said and do what you're told because you were told. And in that, the miracles show up. I'm not talking about speaking in tongues. I'll teach you that as we go through. I'm not talking about healing the sick. I'm talking about God using you to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, win your friends, win your family, win your neighbors. We witnessed a miracle yesterday. Here's Dan Kasich standing here uh, accepting Sarah's, or Sarah accepting his hand in marriage or however that works, you know. I think he, he's the lucky one, right? The guys always are. And, and, and sitting in this pew was his dad who got saved after he got saved, his stepmom who got saved after he got saved, his grandparents, extended family, friends. It's a miracle. That's all in the last four and a half or five years. It's a miracle. You say, what was that? That wasn't the power of a man's witness. I'm telling you, I know Dan. Dan will testify to what I'm saying, so I'm not saying anything out of order. I'm telling you right now, that ain't Dan. That's not Dan. Dan knew nothing about God or the Bible or Jesus Christ when he came to this church. Nothing. We got people in this church right now that thought the Bible was one long book. They didn't know there was a testament. All written by a dude named Jesus. Like he sat down and wrote it all. That's it. Now preaching the gospel. Yeah, that's a human. That's the spirit of God's what that is. And I'm telling you, he can do a work, but he won't do a work if you won't obey him. It's literally that simple. You do what you know to do the best you know how to do it, and you ask him for light and wisdom and direction, and the will of God, the will of God is found. Look what I found. Yeah, because you are on the road of duty. And when you're on the road of duty, the will of God will be found. You got probably four or five guys in this room that are called to preach. How do I know when? How do I know where? I'll tell you exactly what. And, and I'll, now, this is personal that they're preachers so they can take it, but it's a great illustration, okay? You are not going to go somewhere and be a soul winning, do the work of an evangelist, right? That's what God tells a preacher. In other words, win souls. You won't do it in your own church if you don't do it in this one. 
you won't go to a church and hold people together and have unity in the spirit and lead a flock like you're supposed to if you cause trouble here. God will give you what you are. You won't go to another church and have a bunch of people come and give and support that ministry if you don't do it here. You understand what I'm saying? It's the road of duty. That's what it is. God's going to put you in a pulpit ministry and you can't be faithful to show up Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night here. <laughs> You're not going to come sit now and prove it now and you think God's going to put you, well, I just want the will of God for my life. You're not going to find it. Why? Because of the road of duty. You know what's brutal? It's brutal to sit there when you're called to preach and you got it burning in your guts and you hear a man get in a pulpit with it burning in his guts and he starts preaching. When a man can preach and you're called to preach, it makes you want to preach, man. Amen. They just, there's nothing like it. It's just, oh, it's driving me crazy. And the Lord's like, okay, good. Now sit there and just keep your heart right and your mind right and wait. And it's the road of duty. And then what happens? Because I was faithful, I being in the way, the Lord led me. You'll be blown away. At God. I, I'm telling you, telling you, every one of you now, not just preachers, not just picking on these guys. They're great guys. Every one of you will be blown away at what God will do for you. If you'll get filled with the Holy Spirit of God, obey what he says, and follow him in his timing, he will get the job done in your life. All right, let's pray. And uh, I think those guys are here to pick up the tents. I don't know what in the world they think they're going to do. He's jackknifing the trailer out there. All right, be careful when you go out there. Don't let them run you over. <laughs>